crazy if uh the, the aliens like manufactured you to be uh nah. a mixed martial arts fighter they're like let's see if we could just turn this i'm sure into I would, a bad i'm sure if it would have happened i would have been much better than than, than this much know? better than this you're the fucking champion what are yeah you talking but about? if i would be alien manufacturer i would be a <laughs> superman you know Hello, ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, aliens, Martians, any conscious beings tuning into the podcast. I welcome you to episode 46 of Martian Mixed Martial Arts. Welcome to the first episode of Martian MMA in 2019. Hope you all had a great holiday and you are off to a great new year. We had a little bit of a hiatus in UFC events, hence the three-week break in Martian MMA episodes. But this week we are back with the UFC's first card of 2019. The first card on ESPN, ESPN Plus, that is the streaming service, not ESPN, the cable channel. Regardless, a big milestone for the UFC getting onto the ESPN platform. There will be four shows on the main ESPN TV channel, along with, I think, 24 shows streamed on ESPN Plus for $5 a month. So, huge transition for the UFC, and I wish them the best, and I think it will be a good thing. I think that uh, ESPN is a little more mainstream than Fox, and I think that uh, this new ESPN platform could really bring a lot of uh, new viewers to the sport. And it could make things a lot easier for current viewers of the sport, you know, just consolidating uh, a lot of the events down to one platform instead of, you know, having to switch through different channels and uh, different streaming services like we've been used to. So we also have to recap the UFC 232 pay-per-view that went down three weeks ago in Las Vegas, er, excuse me, in California. And we will do that at the end of the podcast. Quickly giving a shout out to Martian MMA's first sponsor, our affiliated sportsbook of Five Dimes. Check out fivedimes.eu for all of your best betting lines. They have the most MMA betting lines out of anywhere by far. Live betting, tons of props, reduced juice lines. Check out the link in the description to find the Martian MMA link. We will be first previewing the UFC card going down this Saturday night, UFC on ESPN Plus 1, Cejudo versus Dillashaw, where bantamweight champion TJ Dillashaw moves down and wait to challenge flyweight champion Henry Cejudo in a champion versus champion super fight. This fight uh, card features 13 bouts in Brooklyn, New York, uh, taking place in the Barclays Center. So starting things off, we are going to be in the welterweight division. We have Chance Rencounter taking on Kyle Stewart. Now this is a fight that has had a lot of uh, changes that have happened to it in the past few weeks. The matchup was supposed to be Chance Rencounter versus Randy Brown, but uh, when uh, Randy Brown showed up to fight week, he was deemed unfit to fight for some reason. And uh, he was then quickly replaced by Dwight Grant, uh, you know, an opponent or a UFC fighter who had a UFC fight very recently that he lost a questionable decision to against Zach Otto. Very, very short uh, notice uh, fight for Kyle Stewart. However, he was training for a fight in LFA, um, you know, against uh, a very good opponent in um uh, I do not know the gentleman. Jared Gooden is the gentleman's name. He's, uh, you know, Kyle Stewart has fought a very good competition in LFA. He, uh, you know, Ty Freeman, who was 9-5, uh, Jason Jackson in the Tuesday Night Contender Series, who was 7-2, and two. J- Jael Willis, 8-0, uh, Brandon Smith, 8-2. and two. So a lot of guys who have had, um, you know, a lot of good uh, regional pro experience. And Kyle Stewart has uh, beaten uh, almost all of them. The only loss in his career is uh, to an opponent named James Nakashima. Uh, and that was earlier this year, but he uh, he won a fight on the Tuesday Night Contender Series, but it was by an opponent injury, so he did not get a contract. So what did he do? He got back on his horse and had four fights in 2018, going three and one. So Kyle Stewart staying very active. He is the betting favorite in this one. We had uh, Kyle Stewart open up as the 
minus 215 favorite to chance run counter at plus 165. The betting lines have tightened up a little bit, and Kyle Stewart is now minus 165. Chance run counter is plus 145. So a lot, I see a lot, little bit of money coming in on run counter. I understand it. A guy who's had some experience in the UFC um, versus an opponent who's coming in on very short notice making his UFC de- debut. Uh, you know, the experience is definitely on Ren Counter's side, but he's only had one fight in the UFC. He looked very mediocre against Balam Muhammad. Balam Muhammad uh, was uh, in the middle of Ramadan for that fight, and, you know, that was a big storyline heading into that one. And it seemed, you know, he kind of fought like it, too. He fought like he was, you know, conserving energy, fighting safe, and uh, he just, you know, easily, um, you know, outstruck Chance Ren Counter. So I do not rate either of these uh, gentlemen in this fight too highly. I think Kyle Stewart has, you know, the better chances of winning this fight but man his takedown defense is very suspect his ground game is not very good he has some power on the feet and some decent striking and I think that that's where he will uh, win this fight but um, neither of these gentlemen, I, uh, I think, are too great. So a uh, little bit of a slow start to this pay-per-view, or excuse me, to this card. But we have a, another uh, welterweight contest coming up next that picks up the pace a little bit. We have Bilal Muhammad, who is 14-2, and two, taking on Jeff Neal, who is 10-2. and two. The betting line for this one opened up Bilal Muhammad as the plus-115 favorite to Jeff Neal as the minus-155 favorite. Since then, some money coming in on Jeff Neal, pushing him to minus-170. Bilal Muhammad up to plus 150. Now, interesting line movement on this one. I think this is a very close fight between uh, two, you know, surging welterweights in the UFC. Blah Muhammad coming off that win off a chance run counter and Jeff Neal coming off of that spectacular knockout over Frank Camacho. Uh, you know, that was on a, a UFC pay-per-view. It really got his, his name out there and, you know, just an emphatic knockout. So uh, I think people are really riding high on that knockout, that performance against Camacho. He also had a nice, uh, a nice uh, finish over Brian Camozzi earlier in 2018 as well. So Jeff Neal is, you know, uh, very powerful striking, and he also has some some ground game to go back on it uh, as well. Blah Muhammad is a very well-rounded uh, mixed martial artist himself. He, uh, I believe, striking would probably be his uh, his strong suit, and you know, the ground game is where he might uh, be a little bit weak. Um, so I think that uh, you know. Jeff Neal might even see the, uh, see this fight to try to take it to the ground. But I think that Jeff Neal will be landing the harder, more powerful shots on the feet. I think that, uh, you know, any way this, this fight goes, I think uh, I would favor Jeff Neal in this one. But, uh, you know, it's still going to be a close fight. Blah Muhammad is not going to, you know, give him an easy fight. It's going to be a tough uh, decision, and I think it will be close, maybe uh, two rounds to one for Jeff Neal. So I'm going to lean uh, Neal's way in this one. In the next fight in the lightweight division, we have Dennis Bermudez, who is 16-9, taking on Tay Edwards, who is 6-2. The betting line for this one opened up Tay Edwards as the plus-130 underdog to Dennis Bermudez at plus-170. The betting line has since flipped... Dennis Bermudez is now plus 105 underdog. Tay Edwards is the minus 125 favorite. So very interesting line movement on this one. Uh, Dennis Bermudez has been the favorite in his past about 10 fights. And it's very interesting that he is now the underdog to Tay Edwards, a guy who is 0-1 in the UFC, who doesn't really have a win over a a very legitimate opponent yet. He has a lot of knockouts over low-level competition in the regional circuit. He's got a good wrestling background, just like Dennis Bermudez does. But other than that, he uh, he's very very green fighter. I would uh, Austin Tweedy would probably be his best uh, best um, win, which was just you know a quick flush knockout. So uh, Tay Edwards, you know, and he was you know exposed in his in his UFC debut. Don Madge, you know, he was out grappling him. He had him in two deep submission attempts, and then he went on to finish him in the, on the feet in that first round. You know, Don Madge was a huge underdog coming into that one. And um, he really showcased, uh, you know, some excellent skills in that one. We thought that Tay Edwards was going to be the one making the, the impressive debut, but he really, uh, you know, Don Madge was the one who stole the show in that one. So Dennis Bermudez is moving up in weight for this fight. He has been at uh, a featherweight for his entire UFC career. I want to say close to 15 fights at featherweight. One of the most, uh, you know, active UFC featherweights in history. And now moving up in weight after three close, close split decisions. You know, he uh, he could have won all three of these split decisions. And he was, you know, just, you know, came up short on every single one of them. Three split decisions in a row. Imagine, imagine that. 
just to, you know, think you did enough every single one of those times you think you won two one and it just gets stolen away from you, which he might have won, you know, two out of three of those fights, maybe all three of them. So uh, he's still very scrappy. He still has got good wrestling. His striking is not very good, though. He, uh, you know, I think that Tay Edwards could have some success on the feet in this one, but I think Dennis Bermudez, if he if he makes this fight a wrestling fight, he gets some scrambles going. Even though Tay Edwards is has a good wrestling background of his own, I think Dennis Bermudez is going to be the much more comfortable MMA grappler in there. And I think that, that this fight will have some good scrambles, and uh, you know it all depends on where this fight goes. So if the fight goes down to the floor, I see Dennis Bermudez having success, winning some rounds, and uh, winning a decision. If it stays on the feet and Bermudez isn't able to get it down, man, I could see Tay Edwards possibly getting the finish. So this is a really good fight. Um, it's interesting, interesting um, with Dennis Bermudez moving up weight, though. A guy who's fought in his entire career at featherweight is definitely a natural featherweight, and after some some tough losses, he decided to move up uh, and wait, you know, I don't, I mean, I would like to see a guy, you know, winning before he moves up and wait, but man, uh, it's tough to, see, to gauge what this move for Dennis Bermudez's career means. It could mean that he is on the way out. He wants, you know, one more fight and he wants to, you know, not, doesn't want to cut any more weight and he wants to just get one and go out on a win. It could be the last fight of his contract. Who knows? So these things definitely matter. And, and, uh, when picking fights, so the storyline behind this one's a bit confusing, but it'll be a good, it'll be a great fight, and uh, I'm going to lean Dennis Bermudez's way, the underdog, uh, in this fight. Next fight in the bantamweight division, we have Corey Sandhagen, who is nine and one, taking on Mario Bautista, who is six and zero. Oh. The betting line for this one opened up Corey Sandhagen as the minus four seventy five favorite to Bautista at plus three twenty five. The betting line has, uh, you know, remained just about the same. Sandhagen is now minus four seventy. Bautista is plus three seventy five. This fight is a uh, another short notice fight. There was supposed to be a great fight between Corey Sandhagen and John Linker on this card. However, very recently again, um, this card suffered an injury. Uh, John Lineker had to pull out of the fight within the past, you know, a uh, few days. So within 10 days of the fight, and they are now bringing in uh, Mario Bautista to make his UFC debut against Corey Sandhagen. So. Uh, Bautista looks game though. He is, uh, you know, he has fought in LFA a few times. He's gotten a few, a uh, few finishes in LFA, and uh, he was training for a fight um, on the uh, the same LFA card that Kyle Stewart was training for on uh, February first, and, and instead of fighting Jaime Hernandez, he is now getting the call up to the big show to fight Corey Sanhagen, and. Uh, Mario Bautista looks like he's, he's got some good skills. He looks like his strength is on the ground. He likes, you know, taking people down, controlling them on the ground, landing some ground and pound, maybe searching for a submission. I would say his striking does look a little, um, you know, green. I think that that uh, could, could uh, have some work on it. But Corey Sanhagen is not really too good of a striker of his own right. Um, you know, it's really kind of hard to get to gauge uh, Corey Sanhagen's career so far. He, uh, you know, had that he had that real nice finish over Austin Arnett, and then he had that uh, you know that questionable performance against Drew Alcantara, where he looked like he just you know wasn't wasn't awake for that fight. He he got stunned in the first uh, you know exchange of the fight, and then he was uh, went on to get into a very very deep submission where he was getting armbarred for a good minute straight. His arm was getting torqued and twisted and wrenched in every possible way you didn't think was possible and he just stood he just held out got out of the submission and then started grounding and pounding Yuri Alcantara beat the pulp out of Yuri Alcantara before getting the submission in the second round so he did get the finish in that one he did uh, you know, uh, you know, get his hand raised at the end of the fight, but man, he started a bit slow in that one. He got caught in a deep submission. I have, like I said, he, by some miracle of double jointedness, he got out of that submission. And uh, I'm, I'm not really remembering his Austin Arnett fight, unfortunately. Uh, I uh, let me uh, let me get some footage on what this one ha what happened in that one. All right, so um, Corey Sandhagen actually outstruck. Austin Arnett in that fight very well and ended up, uh, you know, finishing with some body shots in the second round. So uh, wherever this fight goes, um, it's going to be a tough task for Mario Bautista to get the, the, the job done. We saw that Corey Sanhagen is maybe a little susceptible to submission attempts, but he is hard to finish. He's tough as nails. 
and he's also probably going to be the better striker in there. So uh, even though Bautista was in camp, even though he looks pretty good, uh, you know, for a, a regional 6-0 and fighter, I think that this test is going to be a little bit too much for him, and I think Sanhagen will get his hand raised at the end of this one, probably by decision, um, you know, but he is a pretty wild fighter, so this one could get uh, could get dicey real quick, and, you know, he could, uh, you know, uh, Sandhagen could get the finish or could get finished himself. So should be a good uh, scrap in this one and uh, I'm looking forward to it. Next fight in the light heavyweight division, we have Alonzo Menafield, who is 7-0, and taking on Vincius Moreira, who is 9-1. The betting line for this one opened up Alonzo Menafield as the minus 275 favorite. Vincius Moreira at plus 195. Right now, Menafield has been bet down to minus 290, while Moreira is at up to plus 245. So... A couple of UFC or a Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series veterans coming on uh, to the big show in this one. We have uh, Menafield, who is a powerful striker, and uh, Marrero, who is a good grappler. And, uh, you know, both of these guys, though, are a little bit, um, you know, uh, I hate keep saying the word, but green is the word to use for them. They're a little raw. Their skills are definitely not too well-rounded yet. Menafield is, is, you know, a former football player and a crazy athlete, and, he, you know, someone's you know, probably told him he could he could box, and then he decided to like that. Fell in love with the hands, fell in love with striking, knocking people out, and uh, that's where his MMA career has led him. Uh, Marrera is you know Brazilian. Uh, I imagine he's been grappling for a long time. I imagine he's been doing jujitsu for or most of his career, and all of a sudden decided to hey maybe I can fight uh, instead of just doing jujitsu. So two specialists, I would say, one striker, one grappler, kind of uh, you know trying to make their uh, way in MMA. But they're both, they're both, one of them is, you know, Menafield's great at striking. He's terrible on the ground. Marrera is uh, good on the ground. He's terrible on the feet. He looks really awkward. He looks really uncomfortable in there. And, uh, you know, Menafield was taken down by Daniel Jolly. Uh, is that his name? Yeah, Daniel Jolly. Oh, man. Daniel Jolly is, it was, it was a, a not a good fighter, man. He he quit on the stool after uh, after round one of that fight. He man, what a strange fight that was. He arguably he had a close round. He had some success. He was obviously trying to take the fight to the ground. Got Menafield down, and then um, right when before the set, round two is about to start, the doctor says, "Are you okay?" And he goes, "Ah, my eye, my eye, I can't see." And he gets off the stool and like starts selling like he an injury. Um, who the hell knows what the hell happened there? But he uh, he really quit on the stool. He was about to start the round, and a doctor comes out of nowhere and asks him how his eye is, and he's, uh, he uses it as a cop out, and he's oh my eye, and then the fight's over. So that was that was interesting to say the least. Now and uh, Marrera's. Uh, Dana White Tuesday Night Contender Series also very interesting taking on John Allen in that one just a super sloppy brawl in this one with a lot of you know sloppy grappling exchanges Allen did not really look like he knew what he was doing too uh, well on the ground and eventually got triangle choked in that one all of Moreira's victories are by submission except for one. And, uh, you know, so this fight is, it's it'll uh, it all depends on where it goes. You know, if it stays standing, no question, Menafield wins. If it goes to the ground, no question, Moreira wins. Um, you know, it could, I, I was, the only thing I'm praying doesn't happen is that these two get, you know, gassed out in the first round. And then we see two or th- round two and three of just sloppy, tired uh, you know, MMA. I hope that wh- whatever, whoever wins this fight, they're able to implement their game plan in round one and get the finish in round one. Uh, you know, it should be, you know, exciting for a while it lasts, but like I said, these these guys are not very well rounded. It's, uh, you know, their, their, their skill level, I don't think is really UFC level. So, uh, interesting that they are in this, uh, in this spot, but, um, the pick is I, honestly, I'm going to go with the underdog in Marrera. I think that uh, you know, he, like Marrera looked like he could take a shot on the feet. He looked like he, even though it was very awkward on the feet, he looked like he could you know take a punch, and uh, he was able to persist through some adversity in his Tuesday night contender series fight, get it to the ground and get the submission. Menafield was able to, was taken down by a, you know a very subpar fighter. I think Marrera will also take him down, and I think that he will be uh, susceptible to a submission. The submission line for this one was uh, around. Plus 
plus 400 earlier and it's now all the way down to plus you know 275 somewhere around there let me check what it's at actually right now because and this was a, a gift of a line uh, i think Marrera's only is plus 280 right now i got it at plus 405 the only way that Marrera is winning this fight is by submission honestly i do not think he has the gas tank to go uh the the distance i don't think either of them do honestly and i don't think he has the striking to get a knockout so the pick is going to be Marrera by decision. And I can't believe how long I talked about that bum fight. And moving on to a the first women's fight of the night, we have in the women's flyweight division, Joanne Calderwood, who is 12-3, and three, taking on Ariane Lip- Lipsky, who is 11-3. and three. Uh, The betting line for this one opened up Joanne Calderwood as the plus-155 underdog, and Ariane Lipsky is... Er, <laughs> Ariane Lipsky, excuse me, uh, is minus 195. The betting line currently sits at uh, Lipsky uh, minus 220, Calderwood plus 180. So a little bit of money coming in on Lipsky in this one, very rightfully so. I'm you know, very impressed with uh, with this woman. She uh, it looked really good in KSW. She it looks like her her Muay Thai is is, is exceptional. She looks really she looks really calm in there. She looks like she has a very methodical way of striking. She's you know got some submissions to uh to follow up on her striking with. You know if she's able to rock you with the punch and drop you, she she will snatch a sub if she needs to. And uh, you know she had some 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 losses earlier on in her career. She started off two and two. Or she started off two and three in MMA, and then since then has won nine fights in a row. Really finding her stride in KSW, knocking bitches out left and right. She's she's her Muay Thai is you know it's she still doesn't look very technical. It's just she she adapted her Muay Thai very well for MMA. She's got good footwork. She's constantly moving like in and out. Something that Joanne Calderwood does not do. She is very, very choppy on the feet. She is, you know, definitely, uh, you know, it's hard to say where she, where she, she's, you know, it says her style is Muay Thai, her foundation is Muay Thai, but man, she, she does not have very good striking. Her, her grappling isn't that good either. She, uh, you know, has lost uh, to uh, uh, most of her fights by submission. She's lost three fights by submission, but I'll give it to her. She was taking on uh, Kalindra Faria in her last fight. The better grappler was getting out grappled and then snatched a triangle armbar out of nowhere and was able to finish the better grappler in Faria in that one. So that was a pretty, you know, incredible uh, performance in that one. You know, it was, I think it's sort of an outlier for her career. Uh, Calderwood is, I don't think, a very good fighter overall. So I think this is a, you know, a nice easy task for Lipsky. I think she's going to come and make into UFC debut. She's going to, you know, butcher uh, Calderwood on the feet. She throws real power, man, real power for a woman, uh, for a 125 woman. So uh, I think that she will eventually, uh, you know, land uh, a, a TKO so, sort of flurry and get the stoppage from the referee finishing Joanne Calderwood. So the pick is going to be Lipsky and at minus 220, she's, uh, you know, it seems like a pretty safe uh, pick. In the main event of the prelims, we have a lightweight contest between Donald Cerrone, who is 34 and 11, taking on Alexander Hernandez, who is 10 and 1. The betting line for this one opened up Alexander Hernandez, the minus 130 favorite, Donald Cerrone at minus 110. Since then, a lot of money has come in on Hernandez, pushing him down to minus 190, and Cerrone is up to plus 165. You know, uh, Hernandez actually got his steepest, minus 220 in here. Since then, a little bit more money has been coming back on Cerrone. But very interesting line movement in this one. We have a guy who's only had two fights in the UFC. He's 2-0, one with a quick knockout win over Benil Dariush, and then with a uh, you know an impressive decision win over uh, Olivier Aubin Mercier just uh, a few months ago. Uh, you know, uh, Don Cerrone needs no introduction. One of the you know most notorious UFC fighters ever. He's got the most wins in UFC history, most fights in UFC history. He uh, you know is you know an incredible striker. He's got great ground game as well he's good wrestling he's great everywhere just a true martial artist um like i said he he really needs no introduction he's just you know he's so active he's so great everybody everybody knows don cerrone but uh he he's facing a tough task in alexander hernandez hernandez looks very good he looks you know he he looks like a physical specimen man he he looks shredded in every every aspect of his body might be a, a case for some peds but 
Regardless, I like the guy a lot. He's got good wrestling, good uh, grappling. He's got a good gas tank. Uh, and, uh, you know, his, his pressure is really, really good. The one aspect I think that Donald Cerrone is, might be able to uh, make this fight interesting is on the feet. I, I mean, actually, I, I think... No matter where this fight goes, it's going to be competitive. I think the Dallas Cerrone has the jiu-jitsu and the you know the sweeps, the wrestling to make this fight competitive on the ground. If Hernandez chooses to take it down, I think uh, Cerrone will be reverse in position, threatening with you know submissions, triangles, arm bars like he always does. And uh, I think that if, when this fight is on the feet, I think that if Hernandez is going to be pressuring Cowboy, I don't think, uh, you know, I don't think he's that great of a striker to the point where he's going to be able to, uh, you know, outstrike Cowboy on the feet. Cowboy, I believe, is, is much the much better striker in this fight. Hernandez might be better, uh, you know, with, you know, his, the ground game, you know, it's, it's much closer with the ground game just because he's so aggressive, so tenacious on the ground. Uh, but Cerrone, man, his chances of you know landing some 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 good counter shots on the feet, I think, are are high. I think that he could make Alexander Hernandez pay on the feet, and you know maybe uh, wobble him, and uh, you know force uh, force him to shoot for a takedown, and then Cerrone catches a submission. I think uh, Hernandez could just out pressure Donald Cerrone to a decision, or maybe even you know pressure him to a finish too. I see this fight going a lot of different ways. I think it's a really close matchup. I think it's a closer to 50-50 than anything. So. So at the current odds, you know, Cerrone at plus 165, man, I do not knock a play on the Cowboy at all. He was, you know, an underdog in his last fight against Mike Perry at welterweight. And, uh, you know, people just refused to give him that respect. And uh, he, he uh, you know, he showed everybody in that one. He, he won that fight by submission. Very impressive submission. This one, I think he could submit Alexander Hernandez here. So, you know, this is, you know, I think the best fight on the card. It might even, I think it's better than the main event. It's it's just a really, really great matchup. Uh, looking forward to this one a lot. And uh, if I had to lean one way, man, it's, it's hard to pick a guy. If I had to lean one way, I think that uh, Alexander Hernandez at this point in his career is going is just going to be in better shape. He's going to put the pressure on Cerrone, and I think he has a good chance of winning a decision. But at the odds, at the odds, I would not trust Hernandez minus one ninety. I would definitely uh, advise a play on Cerrone at plus one sixty five. There's just value there, even if even if I think that uh, Hernandez. Uh, it has better chances of winning the fight. Cerrone's chances right now are, you know, let's see. He's plus 165. They're going to be like 37%. Yeah, 37.7%. His chances are more like 45, 50%. So clear value on Cerrone in that one. Hell of a fucking fight. And, uh, you know, this fight's the the main event on the prelims. Some people are questioning, why the hell is this on the prelims? Because the UFC is, is doing things strategically. They're getting people to, to tune in right before the main card. It's a good move. Uh, Cerrone will draw numbers, and uh, I just really can't wait for this fight. So moving on to the main card, we have in the light heavyweight division, Glover Teixeira, who is 27-7, and seven, taking on Carl Robertson, who is 7-1. The betting line for this one opened up. Glover Teixeira, the uh, underdog at minus 105. Carl Robertson at minus 115. Very interesting line opening up. A uh, little bit of money coming in on Glover Teixeira, m- moving him to minus 125. Robertson is still at plus 105. So line margins tightening up in this one. Uh, money coming in on both sides. It, this is a close fight. It's a short notice fight. Glover Teixeira was supposed to fight. Let's see who he was supposed to fight. Um, Ian Kutaleba. And then another, uh, the third injury within a week of this fight uh, happens, and he is quickly replaced by uh, Carl Robertson. He's coming off that victory over Jack Marshman, UFC 230. Um, you know, I don't think he had another fight scheduled, though, so it's in- it'll be interesting to see what type of shape uh, Robertson is in. He showed, you know, good cardio in that Marshman fight. That was the first time he went the distance, or the second time, uh, first time in uh, the UFC, though. So, uh, you know, impressive from him to go to the distance and win that one against a tough opponent in Marshman, but he's also taken on a tough guy in Glover, you know, a very experienced vet. He's on the outs of his career. He's getting older. He's slowing down a little bit, but he's still very dangerous. You know, think back on uh, that, that Misha Serkinov fight, man. He finished Misha Serkinov easily uh, just in 2017, you know, took him down, pounded him out easily. 
you know, he, he didn't need much in that one. He just landed a couple bombs and uh, on the chin and put Sirkonov to sleep. So he's coming off of a loss against Corey Anderson, which, you know, is just a, a young, uh, very um, uh, improving fighter, a good, well-rounded guy. He's got great wrestling, and he's getting uh, much better on the feet too. So uh, no shame in that loss to a much younger opponent in uh, in Anderson, a much higher-level opponent too. And he's fighting on uh, fighting a guy who's a little lower-level skill in uh, Robertson here. So I, I think that Robertson on the feet, he will have the better, he will get the better of these exchanges. I think he's just going to be too quick and powerful for Teixeira. He's moving up a weight class in this one, so I don't think we have to be worried about him cutting down a weight. Uh, you know, he just took this fight, and, you know, he's getting in the zone, not worrying about cutting weight, and he's just uh, going to show up and fight. So, I, uh, you know, that, that that can sometimes be good, not having that that training camp to, uh, to you know, wear on your mind and your body and everything. You just, you know, hop right in there on a week's notice and fight. So, I could see this one going uh, well for Robertson if he's able to keep this one on the feet. Like I said, I think he'll be the quicker uh, striker, and I think that he will could win a decision if he stays or even knock to share out if he lands a nice hard shot. But if this fight goes to the ground, man, I do I see Robertson having some trouble. I think that Glover could, you know, ice some rounds just by staying in top control. I think Glover could possibly get a submission or a ground and pound finish on the ground. I think he's going to have a very big advantage on the ground in this one. Robertson, his only loss did come by way of submission uh, against uh, Cesar Freira uh, not too long ago. Uh, that was by, uh, you know, arm triangle choke. So, uh, it, uh, if this one stays on the feet, I'm going to favor Robertson, and if this one goes to the ground, I'm going to favor uh, Teixeira. But overall, I'm going to pick Robertson. I think he's the you know just so much younger, and you know in different parts of his career, Glover looked like he really, really slowing down in his last fight, and I do not think he has much left in the tank. So the pick is going to be Robertson. Next fight in the women's flyweight division, we have Paige Van Zant, who is seven and four, taking on Rachel Ostovich, who is four and four. The betting line for this one opened up Paige Van Zant as the minus two ten favorite to Rachel Ostovich at plus one sixty. Since then, a little bit of money coming in on Rachel Ostovich, pushing her to plus one thirty five. Van Zant is at minus one fifty five. I agree with the the betting line in this one. Uh, you know, not the original line where it's at now. I think that the original line was a little bit too wide. I would not ever lay two to one on um, Paige Van Zandt really versus anybody. So uh, you know, this is just you know, it's it's a uh, it's uh, I. I I think it's a low-level matchup. Even though both of these women have had uh, some experience in the UFC and uh, experience in Invicta, uh, I hate to say it, but I think these two women are an example of uh, you know pretty girls who get a lot of opportunities in MMA. Rachel Ostovich is a four and four fighter who is no good, does is not really good anywhere. Her, her striking is is um, you know very rudimentary. I don't think I've ever seen her really throw a good strike. And you know her grappling is you know is decent at best. She has one win by sum- one win by submission in the UFC, one loss by submission. So it's man, I, you know she's just not. I just can't say it enough. Just not a very good fighter. I I I kind of question why she's still in the spot. She's you know goes win loss win loss win loss. Not really too successful of a career. And now she's fighting fighting Paige Van Zant, who um you know we know has gotten a lot of special treatment from the UFC. But Van Zant is actually a much more legitimate fighter. And I, I'm not saying neither of these women are, are, are wimps or anything like that. I, I think they're both very tough. But, um, you know, it's uh, it's interesting that this fight's on the main card. It's uh, interesting that, um, you know, uh, either of these women are in the UFC at this point. So um, Paige Van Zandt, uh, you know, she had that last fight against uh, Jessica Rose Clark where she lost the uh, first two rounds, got her arm broken, and then ended up winning that third round with, uh, you know, one arm just by basically throwing kicks. Paige Van Zandt does have very good kicks. She's got decent sub defense. She's got you know uh, decent submissions of her own. Good top position. She showed that against Fleece Herrig, winning that. That's probably her best win in her career against Fleece Herrig back in 2015. But Van Zandt has had some problems with uh, activity. Man, she has had. She didn't have any fights in 2017. Only one fight in 2018, and now she's back in uh, you know for her first her second fight in almost three years. So. 
Um, it's that that ring rust will probably be a factor, but uh, you know I think that uh, like I said on the feet, Ostovic really has nothing to offer. I think that Van Zandt will be spamming kicks, landing a lot of kicks, uh, you know, to the body, landing leg kicks, keeping Ostovic at, at distance. Uh, you know, we'll probably see some some clinches against the cage, maybe some some head and arm throws and some bad scrambles to the floor. I don't think we'll really see either woman implement too successful grappling. I don't think either of them are that good on the ground. So I think that I'll mostly cancel out. So I think that uh, Van Zant's just the more experienced uh, a, a fighter in this one. I think she has, uh, you know, the kicks will be uh, a big factor in leading her to victory. And the pick is going to be Paige Van Zant in this one. Moving on to the next fight on the card in the flyweight division, we have Joseph Benavidez, who is 26 and 5, taking on Dustin Ortiz, who is 19 and 7. The betting line for this one opened up: Joseph Benavidez as the minus 380 favorite, Dustin Ortiz at plus 260. Uh, since then, some money coming in on Dustin Ortiz, making him the now plus 180 favorite. Joseph Benavidez at minus 220. I'm going to agree with the line movement in this one. I think that, that that opening line for Benavidez was way too high, minus 380. That's some crazy, crazy chalk for Benavidez. You know, he did look very, very good in his last fight against Alex Perez, getting that uh, that knockout finish in that one. But uh, ben, uh, Justin Ortiz is, is also coming off a knockout. He's coming off of, uh, you know, I think a three or four fight winning streak. You know, he, he knocked out Matt, uh, Mateus Nicolau. He won that decision over uh, Alexander Pantoja. And uh, also has a finish over Hector Sandoval. You know, Pantoja and Nicolau are some of some of the best bantamweights in the division. That was Nicolau's first loss. Uh, you know, Pantoja only has two losses, and he won that fight. Pantoja's looked excellent since that fight. So both of those wins look really good on Dustin Ortiz's record. So I can't believe he opened up plus 260 in this one. You know, both of these guys are very well-rounded. They, they throw power on the feet. They're both good on the ground. Dustin Ortiz is a good wrestler. J- Benavidez is good uh, jiu-jitsu, great uh, submissions. So, man, this is going to be a great fight. It's um, I- I'm going to favor Benavidez just because he, I think he's the better overall fighter. He's had more success in his career, and even though he's you know getting up there in age, he still looks like he's you know very very. Uh, uh, e- efficient, I you know I don't even know what the word to do. He he's very you know in this prime it looks like still he just knocked out Alex Perez who was coming off of you know some knockout victories of his own. It was a you know a younger, bigger guy who was uh you know coming in off of some really impressive victories and he comes in there and Benavides uh, knocks him out in the first round. So and he's got wins over Henry Cejudo, Zach Makovsky, John Moraga. He's beat Dustin Ortiz before. This is actually a rematch. So you know that's why that's why. Uh, uh, Benavidez is the favorite in this one. I think that, but, you know, Dustin Ortiz is going to make this a close fight. I think that this will certainly be more closer than their first fight. I think Ortiz has gotten a lot better since then. You know, Benavidez, I think, is still improving, too. He's, uh, you know, really uh, one of the one of the un- most underrated MMA fighters of all time, honestly. He's definitely one of the best flyweights of all time. Uh, you know, n- never getting that, that title in the UFC, but still, he's up there. So this is going to be a really good fight. Uh, I expect some good grappling exchanges in this one. I think that these two will be fairly fairly even matched. You know, with the current odds, even even at the current odds, I think that there's a little bit of value on Dustin Ortiz. I think this one's more like a 55-45 a, a uh, type of fight in Benavidez's way. At most, I would say 60-40. So, um, you know, the odds of plus 180, I think, are looking pretty good. I think that, that you know, that that, that gives uh, Ortiz a 36% chance of winning, and I think they're a little higher than that. So there's a little, there's some value on Dustin Ortiz in this one. But the pick is going to be Benavidez, and I'm really looking forward to this fight. Next fight in the lightweight division, we have Gregor Gillespie, who is 12 and 0, taking on Yancy Medeiros, who is 15 and 5. The betting line for this one opened up. Gregor Gillespie, minus 230 favorite. Yancey Medeiros as the plus 170 underdog. Since then, a buttload of money has come in on Gillespie. He is now minus 550. Medeiros is up to pl- plus 425. You know, uh, I guess this is uh, rightfully so in this one. It's, I, I mean, it's still pretty steep now. I think it's, you know, I think I would narrowly the chalk on 
Gillespie at the current price, but you know this is a, this is a very good matchup for uh, Gillespie. Uh, he's got you know some of the best wrestling in the UFC. He wrestled you know against some of the best wrestlers in the world in college. He was you know D1 wrestler wrestling against you know Jordan Burroughs, like literally the, some of like the best wrestlers in America. So uh, and he's looked just you know sensational in the UFC so far. You know five five and zero oh with four finishes. You know, he's got ground and pound, he's got submissions, he's got relentless wrestling pace, everything. So he's, uh, you know, and he likes to throw down, man. This guy throws hard. So the one thing about this, though, is Yancey Medeiros likes to brawl, too. Almost all of Yancey Medeiros' fight ends up with him f- fucking winging punches, you know, with his eyes closed or something like that. You know, he's only he hasn't gone to the distance and uh, since uh, mid-2016. His past four fights have all ended via... Um, via finish he's three and one in those four in his past four too only losing to Don Cerrone so he likes to brawl he's tough as shit he could take a shot he uh you know is gonna he's gonna be willing to brawl on this one so if Gillespie fights smart and and you know shoots for a takedown and you know works his ground and pound and his submissions right away I think that he will easily outclass Medeiros into uh maybe uh you know getting that finish or uh possibly close to a decision too but man if Gillespie wants to train on the feet and get wild like he did against Vince Vince Peichel. I think that Medeiros has a good chance at catching Gillespie with some shit. You know, Gillespie throws throws into the wind. He you know he's not really tucking his chin. He's throwing bombs against the cage. Medeiros can easily clip his chin uh, in one of those exchanges. So. Plus four twenty five, man. I think there's a the value is definitely on Medeiros at this point. You know, maybe even a prop, at, you know, Medeiros by knockout or something like that. I don't, I, I definitely don't see Medeiros, uh, you know, winning this fight um, uh, via the distance. And I think it's going to be pretty, even though Medeiros has a good ground game, I don't think he's going to be able to catch the better wrestler in Gillespie in a submission. So, but Medeiros, you know, the chances of his, him getting a knockout, let's check out what those odds are looking like. Anything over five to one is, is you know, is easy bet. Medeiros TKO plus 675. Man, man that's a good, that's a good price. If he wins this fight, it is clearly by knockout, in my opinion. So uh, Gillespie is going to be the pick in this one, but the value is on uh, Yancey Medeiros and the Yancey Medeiros by knockout prop. Now, in the co-main event of the evening, we have Greg Hardy, who is 3-0, and taking on Alan Crowder, who is 9-3. and Greg Hardy opened up as the minus 245 favorite. Greg or Alan Crowder is the plus 175 underdog. Since then, a lot of money is coming on Greg Hardy, pushing him to minus 515, while Crowder is up to plus 410. Now, Greg Hardy making his UFC debut in this one. He's coming off of two wins on the Tuesday Night Contender Series and some, you know, regional wins and amateur wins. He's a former NFL uh, star uh, turned into a pro MMA fighter. A lot of controversy around him, uh, you know, regarding his domestic uh, violence uh, issues in the past. Um, you know, he was uh, had one of those situations where a girl came forward saying that uh, he beat her with, you know, tons of evidence. And then I believe she withdrew the case and he never really faced criminal charges. So that happens a lot in des- domestic abuse cases. And, you know, but it doesn't mean nothing happened. It doesn't mean he's innocent. And I think uh, almost everybody knows that. So it's interesting to see that he's in the, the UFC, but you know I'm not here to you know question his morals or anything or say it's a bad move by the UFC to have it in there. I mean a lot of the roster probably has some you know domestic violence, assault charges, battery charges. You know they're fucking fighters, so they're not really like you know the most well-behaved people. Regardless, um, you know questionable having him on the same uh, same card as Rachel Ostevich, a recent victim of domestic violence. Regardless, that's been the main conversation of having him on the card. But regardless, getting down to the fight, he's taking on Alan Crowder, who has had some experience in the UFC so far. He uh, you know lost to uh, Justin Willis in his last fight. Um, he has uh, you know fought in the Tuesday Night Contender Series as well. You know, Crowder is, uh, he's, you know, d- he hasn't ha- had a, an entire fight in 2018, and he's now uh, fighting facing Hardy in this one. It se- sort of seems like he's like a lamb for slaughter. You know, the, the UFC obviously wants Greg Hardy to uh, succeed. They signed him after one pro fight. They brought him on the Contender Series a couple times. They're, you know, put him in the co-main event on the first uh, the first card of his uh, UFC career. So they're obviously, you know, pulling for Hardy to do numbers. I'm sure he will, you know, a former NFL star turned MMA fighter knocking dudes out at heavyweight will get viewers so 
it seems like Crowder is, you know, uh, you know, like I said, being brought in for slaughter. But, you know, Greg Hardy runs at you and, and tries to knock you out right away. He doesn't, you know, circle the cage. He doesn't use footwork. He, he doesn't he doesn't know about any of that shit. He wants to come in and fucking knock you out. I doubt he trains jujitsu. I doubt he trains wrestling. I doubt he trains much other than just hitting shit hard. Um, you know, just crushing pads, crushing heavy bags, maybe a little cardio, but... You know, if this fight goes into the later rounds, it's going to be interesting. I, I definitely favor Alan Crowder the longer it goes. Greg Hardy is never really, like, I don't think he's lasted more than a minute in the, the octagon so far. Let's check this shit out. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, a minute and 36 seconds is his longest fight. So I don't think that uh, he, you know, is is going to be relying on going into the later rounds. Uh, and but Crowder has gone, uh, you know, g- gone into the later rounds before. Let's see if he has ever gone. To, he's never. He's gone to the decision one time, and uh, but he's gotten into the second and the third round a few times. So I definitely favor Crowder the longer the fight goes. But so I definitely favor uh, Greg Hardy in this fight outright. I think he will blitz uh, Crowder and, you know, land a devastating punch, knocking Crowder out. But these two are going to swing in the first 30 seconds and they're going to be, you know, throwing bombs. Greg Hardy doesn't have much defense. He only has six MMA fights. Crowder's got, you know, double that amount of pro fights. So it's, it's going to be interesting. I think Crowder has a chance at, at catching uh, Hardy's chin in one of those wild exchanges in the first round. And the prop of Alan Crowder to win in round one is currently plus 950. So, you know, plus 950 that he clips the chin in one of these crazy exchanges is not that crazy. Uh, you know, Crowder by, uh, you know, uh, inside the distance at plus 515, that, that's a, that's an interesting line. It's, it, you know, Crowder is not, gonna, it's not gonna, you know, it's not going to be a walk through the park. It's still going to be a heavy weight in front of Greg Hardy throwing bombs at him. I favor Hardy to get the, the, to land the knockout blow, but... I think that there's value on Crowder at, uh, you know, his round one prop or his knockout prop inside the distance prop or something like that. So uh, interested to see the numbers that Greg Hardy, uh, you know, brings in, see if there's any casual interest from fans. And uh, it should be a good one. A nice, exciting short fight. And moving on to the main event of the evening. We have. Henry Cejudo, the flyweight champion, who is 13 and 2, taking on D- T.J. Dillashaw, who is 16 and 3, the bantamweight champion. The betting line for this one opened up. T.J. Dillashaw is the favorite at minus 175. Henry Cejudo is the plus 135 underdog. Since then, uh, the line is you know going all over the place, but mostly the money coming in on T.J. Dillashaw. He's now minus two ten. Cejudo is up to plus one seventy five. So, I'm gonna agree with the line movement where it was set originally, not now. I think that this is gonna be a much closer fight than a lot of people are thinking. There's a lot of uh, you know stories behind this fight. You know, T.J. Dillashaw moving down in weight. He was already you know a fairly slim you know 135er. You know, he definitely fit the frame for the weight class. He looked pretty you know pretty rough when he was cutting down. You know, you see his you know the cheekbones. You know, like his cheekbones are sticking out on his face. You can really see it when he's weight cutting. But he decides to drop another 10 pounds, another you know whatever you know eight percent of his body weight. And uh, to make this flyweight um, for the first time in his career. So, uh, you know, Henry Cejudo is not no stranger to, you know, dropping down to, to flyweight either. He's had his fair, st- fair share of struggles making the 125-pound limit as well. So weight is going to be a, is a huge, uh, you know, discussion point amongst this fight. You know, we've had a lot of scenarios like this lately against, you know, uh, against champions. Like is, what about Cormier's hand? Is that going to play a factor in his fight? Or what about Max Holloway's concussion? Is that going to play a factor in it? John Jones's, um, you know, uh, drug test or something like that or his layoff. There's a lot of, you know, people are always questioning this, you know, there's a narrative behind every fight. And for this fight, that is the weight cut. Whether T.J. Dillashaw will be the same fighter he is at 135, at 125. At 135, he's one of the the top pound for pound fighters on earth. He's got you know, some, I think he's probably the best striker in MMA. He's got you know incredible movement, incredible uh, striking kicks, um, you know punches. He's working with Dwayne Ludwig, one of the best in the game, 
And he's also got great wrestling to go along with it. He wrestled in college. He's out wrestled opponents in, in the UFC when he's needed to. He known that uh, you know T that John Linker was a dangerous striker, so he took him down and beat him with wrestling in that one. But uh, <clears throat> if we're talking wrestling, we got to mention Henry Cejudo, the the U.S. Olympic gold medal winner in wrestling the youngest uh, i think gold medal gold medal wrestling olympian in u.s history henry cejudo um the flyweight champion just beat demetrius johnson dethroned the longest reigning ufc champion in history um and you know beating him three rounds to two in that fight a very very close decision actually a split decision there's a lot of discussion around that fight it was a you know razor thin decision but the consensus is that um Henry Cejudo was able to edge out three of those rounds, but all five of those rounds were razor close. It takes it takes very very you know uh, uh, an astute mind to differentiate who won those rounds. A very very you know. Um, uh, accurate eye for mixed martial arts to pick who you know there was takedowns in that fight but they reversed the takedowns and then who who does that score for he was down for 10 seconds then he reversed the position but he still got him down you know there's all these questions and a lot it's actually a lot of personal preference in that one so he uh d you know Cejudo has improved massively, though, in his past couple of fights. You know, he lost to Demetrius Johnson, and he was, I think, 3-0 in the UFC, 4-0 in the UFC, got his first uh, title fight and was absolutely dismantled by Johnson, had a very, very close fight with Joseph Benavidez, and then he's just gotten better and better at each and every fight since then, knocking out Wilson Hayes, looking uh, showcasing his striking for the first time in that one, and then beating uh, the well-rounded uh, Sergio Pettis to a decision, earning that rematch at Demetrius Johnson, and then making uh, the opportunity opportunity to count winning that fight winning the championship and dethroning the champion Demetrius Johnson in that that fight so you know this is going to be a, you know a very very epic fight at first I thought it was kind of unnecessary I thought that you know there's there's guys that fly weight the, the one thing is there's not too many people that fly weight who can challenge for the title I guess you could give Joseph Benavidez the challenge for the title he already has a win over Suhudo and that seems like a good title fight you could have given the the bantamweight title shot to Marlon Marias or Rafael Asuncao or Dominic Cruz or whoever there's a lot of opponents so people were kind of questioning why they were making this matchup that why they were holding up both divisions but uh you know there's a lot of speculation on if the flyweight division is, is being disbanded uh, you know a lot of flyweights have been cut this fight is still a flyweight though henry cejudo seems like he wants to keep the flyweight division alive he thinks that if he wins this fight then the flyweight division will stay alive because he beat the other champion and uh you know, if TJ Dillashaw wins, it's likely the end of the weight class. Uh, you know, it could be the last uh, flyweight fight in UFC history. So, um, it's it's going to be uh, an interesting one to see the uh, see how it plays out. Uh, you know, TJ is going to be trying to keep the fight standing using his you know defensive wrestling and making his, his his shots count on the feet. You know, he he might not have too much time on the feet in this one. You know, um, Suhudo is going to be relentless with the takedown, closing the distance, shooting all the time. But if you know Dillashaw can make the, that time on the feet pay and you know land some hard stiff shots and rock Cejudo while they're on the feet then I see Cejudo, uh, then I see TJ Dillashaw having success you know possibly getting the knockout um it's going to be difficult for TJ to, to win the decision in this one not only because he's dropping that additional 10 pounds and his cardio is unknown at uh at 125 pounds uh, but also just because you know we we just saw demetrius johnson one of the best fighters ever just have a very very close decision with cejudo because of those those close takedown exchanges those razor thin rounds you don't want to be faced up against a decision uh, a, a scorecard with those close rounds and with a you know a wrestler who's you know uh constantly closing distance who's got a great gas tank who's relentless with the takedown you don't want to have to go to the scorecards like demetrius johnson did and get robbed of a decision possibly so to or tj is definitely going to be looking for the knockout if his cardio is up to par if it, he is the same fighter he is at 135 pounds i see tj dillashaw getting the finish in what the third fourth or fifth round the later rounds I think that the he's going to be stuffing the shots and then you know landing uh, you know the, that, those barrages of punches that TJ Dillashaw is notorious for. He uh, that that's just going to be uh, you know that's his style. He likes getting you against the cage and just punishing you with like a relentless you know kicks, knees, elbows, punches. He's done it to multiple multiple opponents. He's won world titles that way. 
and uh, he's defended his title that way. He's truly one of the best uh, martial artists in the world today. But Cejudo, man, he's going to if he is able to close that distance, if he's able to take uh, Dillashaw down and create scrambles, I think he's going to be much better in those scrambles. He's going to be. You know, he's the, you know, obviously the better wrestler. He's had fights with scrambles. He's used to the weight class. He's gone five rounds at the weight class recently. If this fight goes to the distance and it's Henry Cejudo is able to implement his takedown heavy game plan, then I think that he will win the decision and possibly uh, beat TJ Dillshaw in this fight. It's going to, you know, it has a lot of different ways of playing out. Um, so, you know, where the betting line is currently at, Dillshaw at 2-1, to one, I, can't, I can't lay the chalk in on that one i think there's actually uh value on on cejudo in this one plus 175 that, that gives uh cejudo's implied probability at 36 percent you know again i think this one's closer like more like you know 60 40 or 55 45 in favor of dillshaw i think that uh you know dillshaw should be the favorite but man what the line currently sits at now i think that the value is on cejudo uh, you know, so I would go with Cejudo money line or Cejudo by decision, and then maybe uh, hedge a little bit on Dillashaw rounds three, four, and five. So that's going to be my analysis for the fight. Like I said, originally when this fight was announced, I wasn't too happy about it. I wasn't too thrilled about the divisions being hold, uh, held up. But as the fight crept closer and closer, I realized how great of a matchup it'll be. And uh, we're in for a really special fight on Saturday night. So, you know, great fight for the UFC to bring to ESPN Plus for the first time. It's going to be a great card. It's got good fights top to bottom. And, um, you know, really looking forward to Saturday night breaking that uh, hiatus uh, of three weeks where there were no UFC cards. So that is going to be all for the UFC Brooklyn analysis going down Saturday January 19th, 2019 from the Barclays Center in Brooklyn, New York. And we are now going to transition to UFC 232 that happened on December 29th, 2018, three weeks ago in California, Los Angeles, California. We did not get to recap this card because of that hiatus in the UFC, like I said, uh, like I mentioned. So we're just going to quickly breeze through this card because we got to cover every single fight in, that happens in the UFC on Martian MMA. Can't miss one. We predict it beforehand, and we uh, we review it after it happens. So uh, Montel Jackson starting things off, getting that quick finish over Brian Kelleher. He rocked him with an elbow to the back of the ear and was able to cinch up that uh, that uh, Darce choke in this one. So finally, Montel Jackson shows his potential. He shows that power, and he shows the his, he's got some submissions as well, and two in that one. So Brian Kelleher, man, he he, you thought you had a great chin. He ate hundreds of shots from Linker, man. That that could that performance could have you know left some permanent damage on Brian Kelleher. He might his chin might never ever be the same again. So uh impressive performance from Montel Jackson in this one. Curtis Melender defeated CR Badarizari via decision in that one. That was a close fight. It was uh you know very you know a very sloppy, you know, uh fight it, had, it went back and forth. I believe Melender won early and then CR was able to, you know, um win the latter part of the fight. It was close. It, um you know, I thought that uh I thought that uh, Melender, you know, it looked a little underwhelming in there. He, he, CR was, you know, standing right in front of him, eating, eating every shot he threw at him. He barely had any defense, but Melender was not able to finish. And he showed, you know, a little bit of weak cardio, and he showed some weakness on the ground in that one from uh, Melender. So, um, you know, nice win, but uh, I think there's still some work to be done on Melender. Uriah Hall with an incredible comeback victory over Bevon Lewis. Bevon Lewis was winning the first two rounds of this fight, and Uriah Hall ends up knocking him out. Uh, with, a, I believe, an uppercut in the th third round of this fight. Impressive finish there. Nathaniel Wood uh, outgrappling Andre Yule, getting the submission via rear naked choke uh, in the third round of that fight. Very impressive performance from Wood. He's a really well-rounded uh, fighter, while Yule is you know, good on the feet, but, man, his ground game needs major work. Ryan Hall made quick work of BJ Penn with an, a beautiful m &I roll to a heel hook. Just, you know, one of the best grappling exchanges you could ever possibly hope for in MMA just absolutely beautiful jiu-jitsu you know executed perfectly just high high level stuff against you know another black belt in PJ Penn so terrific victory from Ryan Hall uh, Piotr Jan defeated Douglas Silva Deandrade via corner stoppage. Bam! Jan just beat the brakes off of Andrade in this one and uh, you know I, I saw it going this way I thought it was going to be either a very lopsided decision, but I did not see Andrade lasting to the scorecards. Jan is, you know, one of the most 
uh, accurate and powerful boxers in the UFC right now, and he's just a you know a wrecking ball going through the UFC. He's got great ground game as well, so I think that he could possibly challenge whoever the the uh, bantamweight champion is, but you know maybe by 2020. So. Um, next fight, Megan Anderson defeating Kat Zingano via an eye injury TKO. Uh, you know, Megan Anderson threw a kick and, and, you know, her toe went right in Kat Zingano's eye and Kat Zingano basically was just holding her eye. Basically quit after that one. She, you know, couldn't see out of the one eye and the fight was, uh, declared a TKO. I believe Kat Zingano has since, uh, re- uh appealed this decision, but, uh, she has no chance at winning that. It was a legal strike. It was a, you know... You can't. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, you you kicking someone in the face and your toe goes in their eye. It's not. It's not the person who's throwing the kick's fault. It was a legal strike. You know, it just happened to you know land. Uh, you know, unfortunately, and um, you know, it caused the injury. If you throw a leg kick on someone and it blows their knee out, it's not a. It's not a. Uh, a no contest. They inadvertently threw that kick to to hurt you, just like Megan Anderson did, and it did its job. And it's, it did its job. So. Uh, nice performance from Anderson in that one. Uh, Katzengana really shit the bed. Um, next fight, Walt Harris defeating Andre Arlovsky in a very uh, low output decision. Very, you know, boring fight. You know, crazy scorecards in this one. Two rounds to one for Harris by two judges and then three rounds to zero for Arlovsky. Just r- very, very questionable to scorecards in that one. Um, moving on to the pay-per-view. Man, what a fucking pay-per-view card man one of the best all year the last pay-per-view of 2018 but and these five fights were electric um alexander volkanovsky defeated chad mendez in a back and forth war man getting that tko finish in the second round these guys were standing in front of each other throwing bombs these man just an incredible fight from both gentlemen chad mendez retiring after saying you know he doesn't he just doesn't really have it anymore that was the plan win or lose so unfortunately he has to go out on a loss but chad mendez you know one of the best featherweights of all time he's uh you know always came up a little bit short when it really mattered against you know aldo twice against um mcgregor against edgar and here against volkanovsky but still you know one of the most uh accomplished featherweights of all time Next fight, the only fight on the uh, boring fight on the main card, Corey Anderson defeated defeated Ira Latifi two rounds to one. Latifi was landing bombs in the first round. He was landing hard shots, hard uh, punches. I really thought Corey Anderson was going to sleep, but he uh, his chin held strong. His chin's gotten much better over the past couple of fights. He was able to you know make this fight go into the latter rounds and uh, win rounds two and three to get the uh, decision in this one. So nice performance from Corey Anderson. And uh, Ira Latifi's uh, card here looked pretty bad in this one. Uh, next fight, Michael Chiesa defeated Carlos Condit by, via Kimura. You know, uh, Chiesa uh, very predictably outgrappled Carlos Condit in this one, getting the submission. Great performance from Chiesa, moving up to welterweight, making his debut there. And Carlos Condit, for the love of God, please retire, my man. Or maybe, you know, give him a fight against a striker, just someone who's not going to take him down and, uh, you know, give him a Robbie Lawler rematch or something like that. Um, you know, he's, you know, lost like five of six fights or something like that. So Carlos Condit, uh, unfortunately, it's time to go, buddy. Next fight for the women's featherweight title fight, we had the super fight between Amanda Nunez and Chris Cyborg. And in, 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 in crazy, unpredictable outcome, Amanda Nunez absolutely starches Chris Cyborg in the first round. You know, they, they came out throwing leather right away, throwing bombs, heat you know, just standing in the pocket trading. It looked like it looked like Cyborg landed a couple hard right hands. And then it looked like they decided to just like say fuck it and just start trading. But then they started throw they started trading, started standing in the pocket, and Amanda Nunez was the one who really landed that hard shot. She rocked Cyborg, you know, made her drop down for a second. She got back to her feet for a few seconds. Amanda landed Amanda landed uh, you know, a nice three punch combination that rocked Cyborg even more and then one final overhand right that sent Cyborg flying through the air, a one punch knockout from Amanda Nunez. You know, an incredible underdog performance, moving up in weight class, taking on, you know, the undefeated Cyborg. She hasn't lost in ten years, beat every girl she's fought in the past ten years in MMA, you know, one of the most feared women, uh, feared fighters in uh, MMA history, and Amanda Nunes goes up to her weight class and knocks her out in 51 seconds, just an 
unbelievable performance, man. I was screaming my fucking ass off. I don't think I've ever screamed so loud. It's, you know, I, I missed the Ronda Rousey uh, knockout when she got flatlined by Holly Holm. Uh, you know, I fell asleep, I think, a few fights before that and missed, the, the you know, the, one of the biggest upsets of all time. But uh, you know that that it's had that it had that same feeling. This woman who was undefeated for ten years, and you know, it was knocking everybody else out. She's supposed to be the better striker. She's supposed to be the bigger woman in there. She's she's the favorite, and she gets just flatlined. Uh, you know, I picked Amanda Nunes in this one. I had a little bit of action on her. I actually, right before the fight, I tweeted Amanda Nunes one punch KO. I just, I, I don't know. I had a feeling something, something crazy was gonna happen, and that's exactly what did, man. Just, uh, you know, an electric fight. Uh, Amanda Nunes scoring that knockout, and you know, one of the I think most memorable moments uh, ever watching UFC. So, congratulations to Amanda Nunes, the first ever women's two weight champion, simultaneous two weight champ. She, I don't think she's gonna give. Cyborg a rematch. Cyborg does not deserve a rematch. How the hell can you say you deserve a rematch when someone smaller than you went up to your weight class and starched you in 50 seconds? It wasn't close. It wasn't a close, hard-fought decision. Could have gone either way. It wasn't had some success and then lost in the later in the fight. No. She got murked. In 50 seconds, there's no argument. There's no argument for a, a fucking immediate rematch. Same thing, Steve Miocic. Daniel Cormier went up to your weight class, knocked your ass out, and stole your belt. You don't get an immediate rematch. Honestly, you got to be pretty ballistic to think that you deserve an immediate rematch after getting absolutely starched in 50 seconds. So... Amanda Nunes will be going back down to 135. You know who the hell who the hell is going to challenge her at 135? You know maybe there's uh you know uh, I don't even know uh, the the real fight I guess it would be Shevchenko now the 125 pound champ. Nunes I think wants to go down to 125 and get the third belt, be the first ever triple champ, and she's got a good shot. She's got two wins over Shevchenko. If if you all you have to do is diet a little bit and go down in weight class. And, uh, you know, and you can be the first ever triple champion in the UFC and you already beat the girl who has the belt twice. Man, that's a pretty big incentive right there. So who knows what Nunez will do next? I mean, let's look at the UFC rankings and see who the hell can challenge her at 135. Oh, Holly Holm. That's the other. That's the only other fight. I guess Holly Holm would be the yeah, would be the, the next logistical challenger for um for Amanda Nunez, you know, Holly Holm, they have not fought yet. Nunez has wins over uh, Duranda May, uh, you know, Pennington. And she lost his Ngano. Um, so, you know, Amanda Nunez, it seems like the next fight for her, hopefully, will be Holly Holm at 135. Uh, and uh, if not, then maybe uh, she'll fight uh, Shevchenko at 125. You know, actually, Holly Holm is booked against Aspen Ladd. Aspen Ladd's a very legitimate opponent. You know, Aspen Ladd could uh, somehow beat Holly Holm and then come in for a title shot against Amanda Nunez. That'll be a good fight, too. So, um, you know, the, the future is bright for Amanda Nunez, man. She's, she's the best female fighter that's ever lived she's she uh let's see what she did she beat valentina shevchenko twice the champion twice the the ufc champion twice she beat jermaine durandame ufc champion uh by knockout by the way she knocked out ronda rousey champion she uh submitted misha tate champion uh and then she goes up to to featherweight and knocks out the champion chris cyborg so she's beaten five UFC women's champions. One, two, three, four, five. There's only been like eight. eight there's been Nami Yunus, uh, Yajacek, Esparza, Montano, Shevchenko, Rousey, um, Holm, Tate, and uh, Nunes Cyborg and Shevchenko. So, so she's beaten, you know, half the women's champions, you know, there's no doubt she's the greatest female fighter that's ever lived. And, uh, you know, just congratulations to her. You know, I hope that uh, her and her wife and Nina Ansaroff, you know, have the time of their lives in the next couple months. Man, you want to talk about, like, a story. You have a, a women's lesbian couple who went 4-0, undefeated in mixed martial arts in, in, in 2018. One of them is the two weight champion. I mean, I, I don't understand. You know, people are looking for you know stories about you know uh, 
uh, what's ma- marginalized people, you know, doing great things, man, th- that's a, bl- a blueprint right there is, you know, two women who, uh, you know, are some just living it up as a, you know, probably the best couple in the UFC right now. There's, you know, maybe a Montana De La Rosa and Mark De La Rosa. Yeah, well, they're not at the highest level as Ansaroff and uh, Nunes are. You know, both of those women have just improved so drastically. I just can't say enough good things about them. You know, Nina Ansaroff is in the top five of, of straw weight right now. We could see her challenging for a belt soon. So. Uh, so that's enough about that one. Moving on to the main event, we had John Jones uh, run through Alexander Gustafson, finishing him in the third round. It was weird. The first two rounds of this fight, I don't really remember. They were pretty low activity. I think John Jones was winning them, you know, just outstriking uh, Gustafson. His, you know, his kicks were on point, uh, like always. And then eventually just blasted for a takedown, took Gustafson down, and pounded him out to get the finish. It made it look easy. The greatest of all time, uh, John Jones is back. And, uh, you know, who knows what's next for him? I Actually, we do know what's next. Anthony Smith, he's now been announced to fight Anthony Smith um, in March 2nd in Vegas. Who knows what happens after that if he'll fight um, Steve Miocic, Cain Velasquez, uh, Daniel Cormier, Luke Rockhold. Who the hell knows? But, uh, you know, John Jones has a lot of options now. He wants to stay active. He wants to, you know, pass a bunch of drug tests. He wants to, uh, you know, get that uh, that GOAT title back under his name undisputedly. Um, right now, there's a little bit of you know uh, dispute amongst who's the best and can't be can't be a guy who failed drug test, right? But um, so um, the future is bright for John Jones. Hopefully, we get to see him in the octagon uh, a lot in 2019. Hopefully, he stays out of trouble, and uh, you know that's what we can hope for. Uh, at all times so um, that is going to conclude the UFC 232 recap and uh, you know before we go as always we would just uh, mention a few uh, you know, stories that are big in the, the world of MMA this past couple weeks. I mean, we did miss a few weeks, so we have to, uh, you know, catch up on everything. Um, the one uh, thing, John Jones did pass his drug test from UFC 232. We do know that now. He uh, was, uh, you know, has been cleared of all the drug tests so far, so no more drama that's going to come along with that one. We just hope to, um, we hope to, uh, you know, for him to remain clean for the next you know year for the rest of his uh career so um honestly other than that though oh yeah we have rose namunis defending her belt against jessica andraj ufc 237 in brazil we have uh, edson barbosa versus justin gichi announced for ufc philadelphia uh going down march 30th the ufc's first return to philadelphia in about eight years since two ufc 2000 or i mean i think since 2011 ufc UFC 133, so just an insane amount of time. Almost 100 pay-per-views later, they're coming back to Philadelphia finally. So, um, and uh, honestly, you know, oh, not that much, uh, not much, not much in the news. It's been a slow couple of weeks in the world of MMA. You know, no, uh, M- uh, no UFC cards going down. I think Bellator goes down in a few weeks. But uh, you know, we will be back in the UFC. I don't think there's UFC next weekend, but I think after that, I believe there's seven or eight shows in a row. So we will be have a busy schedule on the U- on Mar- the Martian MMA program, and uh, I hope uh, you are all enjoyed the episode uh, of Martian Mixed Martial Arts. This has been episode 46. Make sure you check out our affiliated sp- sports book, 5dimes.eu. You can check out the uh, the Martian MMA uh, link to it for that in the description. Follow me on Twitter. Check me out on SoundCloud or iTunes, YouTube at Martian MMA, at UFO UFC on Twitter. And ladies, gentlemen, boys, girls, aliens, Martians, any conscious beings tuning into the podcast, I thank you for tuning in to the episode 46, and I hope you enjoy the UFC on ESPN1. I will see you guys next week. Peace.